Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Crime and Entertainment. I have here a very special guest. Now, as you know, I like to talk with actors. I like to talk with, you know, guys that have been involved in athletics, such as boxers, football players. I like to talk with guys that have been involved in a little bit of organized crime. And this individual checks every one of those boxes here. Please welcome to the show, Jack O'Halloran. Jack, how you doing, my friend? I'm doing the best I can, whatever they'll let me get away with. <laughs> All right, we all. Now, now look here. You're going to be synonymous, I'm sure, by most people from the Superman movies where you played a character named Nan. Um, that's where a lot of people are going to you know, recognize you from, but you've got such a deep story, and you've got branches that just kind of go everywhere. You've lived a heck of a life. So when it's people's first time on the show, I kind of like to start from the beginning and work our way forward. Um you have a very well-known father, especially in the organized crime world. Kind of tell us a little bit about, you know, your upbringing, what that was like, and, you know, the, the situations and when you realized who your father was. Well, I was a, um, a wartime romance. Albert, uh, my father, was probably one of the most powerful Italians that ever came in the country, and he... Uh, ran a little company called Murder Incorporated. And it was the Anastasia family that turned into the Gambino family. Mm -hmm. uh, Carlo Gambino was my father's underboss. And uh, Albert was uh, Albert was kind of a, a very uh, unusual fella. You know, he, uh, he uh, I, I only met him once in my life. And um, came I was 14 years old and uh, when he was when he was shot um, in 1957 and he came to watch me play uh, a freshman year my freshman year of high school all of a sudden these four guys came to a game and they were all dressed in you know <laughs> overcoats and, and fedoras and everything that and people thought they were actually college scouts <laughs> and it was Albert with the, with three of his three of his friends came to watch me play a game, and, and then I sat down with him afterwards for the first time, and he uh, I was set up to go and meet him in New York. Uh, he wanted to sit down and he wanted to open a relationship with me, and and, uh, and he got shot that week, and wow. he got shot because Albert wouldn't go in the drug business, and my father controlled all the docks of the world of of America. And he, uh, in The Godfather, when they went to Brando, and Brando said that if we touch it, our children will touch it, it'll be the downfall of the families. Well, Albert said that. He said, this is not a business that we signed up for. And, I don't, and you know, Genovese was in, it, in Italy, and he wanted to bring it in through the ports. And Albert said, it's not a good idea. And, um, and he was right, because... After, but Albert was the glue that held everything together. When they shot him in, in 57, and it was the most prolific gangster shooting that there was all over the newspapers in the barbershop when he got shot. And, you know, uh, and he knew it was going to happen. He'd, he'd already digressed a lot of things and sold his house to Buddy Hackett in Fort Lee. And, um, it was, uh, but he left 256 pages for me. Of, of outlining certain things. And, and then I was looked after by Meyer Lansky and Frank Costello. Wow. Uh, and a few other people that uh, took over the reins of looking after me and uh, when I was raised up. And uh, I always had a minder around me when I was a kid. It was a guy that was a, an Irishman, actually, Rip Collins. And he was uh, an engineer at General, General Electric, but he ran the IRA in the waterfront in Philadelphia. And he was a minder of mine. He taught me a lot of things when I was very young and preparing me for my father's world, you know, uh, much to my, uh, but he, he maybe got me into athletics. He got me into a lot of good things, taught me a lot of scholarly things and a lot of good stuff. And uh, so by the time my, my father died and, and, uh, when I was 19 years old, I uh, had a chip on my shoulder and uh, 
it's all, and I put this in the book of family legacy. And it, you know, and I, I went to Sicily and I took care of some business over there. And I got involved with some people there and the, the, the um, Frank and them, I had to leave the country. So they sent me to Sicily and I met some people and came back and, uh, and, and I was going to play pro ball with the New York Jets. When, when I was playing football, you had your class had to graduate college before you were allowed to play pro ball. Right. And there were a lot of guys that, you know, they left school in their freshman year, sophomore year. I went for one year and, and college was boring. So, um, and the Jets picked me up right away. And then we played on what they had, like a, like they had farm teams on the East Coast that a lot of ball players, Dick Christie and uh, a lot of guys that were played for the Jets and, other teams, we, we played on these, we played like two games a week to keep your levels up. And by the time I came ready to play football, I had uh, told uh, Eubank I wanted to go down and play in Philly because a lot of friends of mine were down there. And he said, well, you always have a home here in New York. I went down to Philadelphia and they had sold the team and a guy named Jerry Wallman bought the team and hired a guy named Joe Q. Howard to, to come in and coach. And I watched this guy trade a championship football team. He traded Sonny Jurgensen, Tommy McDonald, a, a whole bunch of people within a two-month period. And uh, Timmy Brown, which was a great running back, he and I came out of a meeting one day, and Q. Harrick walked right by us. So I said, you don't talk to water. And Timmy, I said, you know, take this team and stick it. Ali had just won the title. And some friends of mine in Philadelphia that controlled boxing, I said, I can beat that guy. And they said, well, that's a good idea. So I got thrown in the gym and my boxing career started, but I, I was already involved in pro sport. And in those days you couldn't have amateur and pro. So I couldn't box amateur. I went in the gym for six months and started boxing professional from the get go. Wow. You know? but no fights. Yeah. You started boxing professional. <clears throat> and it worked out pretty good, you know, and, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I was 16 and 0 when they discovered that I had a disease called acromeglia, which is a tumor of the pituitary gland. And the doctor said, how can you even possibly mentally get up to fight? Because the, the disease caused such mental depression, they said. And I said, well, it was my day job. You know, I was <laughs> boxing in the daytime and taking care of my father's business at night and uh, with the unions and everything. And, so you no, did just, get into the racket. So l later on, after he passed away, you did kind of get into somewhat of that well, life. I got into it when I went to Sicily. I mean, I did something. Um, some things you, you can talk about. Some things, some things you can't talk yeah, about. I'm, because I'm picking up what no you're statue, putting down. <laughs> no statue limitation. You know right. I'm, I'm picking up what you're putting so down. <laughs> I, I did something that I. They were very. Meyer and Frank were angry that I did it, but I. Uh, I wasn't going to sleep until my father's death was settled. And uh, so I did, they sent me to Sicily and then I went to Sicily and I, I did something in Sicily that caused Genovese a terrible headache because a big boatload of dope that was supposed to go to New York and was already paid for and everything sank in a, off of uh, Palermo. Uh, somebody blew this thing up and made it sink and, it caused a lot of grief for somebody, people in New York. And, uh, wow. So, so I came back to the United States and, um, and I got into my boxing career and, uh, and I, uh, you had different. some pretty, I, was, I mean, famous fights. I mean, you fought George. Well, yeah, I, was, I was world ranked for several years and I'm in a couple hall of fames for the Pennsylvania, New York, uh, New California, New England and Oklahoma. Now, I, I, I fought some, I beat some good contenders. I lost some good contenders. Um, but I never, like I trained for George Foreman for a week. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and had a hell of a fight with him in New York, Madison Square Garden. I heard him bad in the second round. I just didn't follow it up. Then I walked into a punch, you know, and it, it's just part of boxing. But I beat Cleveland Williams, Terry Daniels. I beat a lot of world-ranked fighters. And, uh, yeah, if so I'm not mistaken, world, you beat you, you you beat Alvin Lewis when he was ranked number one, and then right. Manuel Ramos at number two. Yeah, he had just fought Muhammad Ali, and uh, 
in Ireland, went 13 rounds with him. And they came back, he beat Terrell and he beat another guy. And uh, then he was supposed to fight Buster Mathis, but Mathis couldn't get a license in Michigan where he was from. So they called me up in California and they had just taken my license away for organized crime in California, which was all bull. But uh, when they called me, I said, will you fight out in Blue Lewis? I said, can I get a license? And the guys knew me and he said, oh yeah, we'll give you a license. Are you, you're going to take the fight? I said, send me a ticket. He said, you'll take the fight? I said, send me a ticket. And I went up to Detroit and um, I had been running. I was in pretty good shape, a lot more better than they thought I was. And when I went up and uh, they, uh, I was training in the gym and they, and uh, Blue Lewis was trained by a great trainer. And he sent a guy over to look and watch what I was doing. And he watched me skip rope for an hour and hit a speed bag for an hour and then spar six rounds. And he went back and said, I think we're in trouble. This kid's in pretty good shape. <laughs> and I had a friend of mine that ran the streets of uh, Detroit, a little black kid who was uh, a great fighter. He was like a lightweight Olympic champion and all. But he, he was a street gangster and he ran Jefferson Boulevard. And I said to him, I want you to bet every single round of this fight. He looked at me and said, Jack, you're fighting Alvin Blue Lewis in his hometown. He, this guy can fight. And I said, every round I want you to bet it. I'm going to beat this guy badly. And I beat him badly. I beat him 10 out of 10 rounds. I beat him bad. Man. I broke his ribs. I broke his wrist. I beat him bad. So I hope and, you took your advice. <laughs> And, uh, and so I, but then no one would fight me. And I, I, when I did things like that is when I knocked out Manuel Ramos, who was number three in the world in LA. And they, after the fight, they came to me to do a picture, a great way hope with, uh, with, uh, what's his name? Uh, great actor, black actor. Uh, they wanted me, there was a big movie in Hollywood, James Earl Jones. Yeah, and I and I turned it down. They did it. And it was and Raymond Patriarca from Rhode Island put the deal together with uh, with uh, Eddie Foy the third and Fox, who was running Fox, and they, they thought I was just going to walk in and sign the contract and go to Spain and stay there for six months. And I said, Wait a minute! I just knocked out Manuel Ramos. I'm looking to fight Ali, and you want me to go to Spain for six months? I don't think so. And the guy said, well, I thought this was all signed. All you were going to do is come in and sign a contract. And I said, well, you know, I'm not ready for this. And, and, and I left and they said, oh, my God, Raymond's going to be. I said, I'll take care of Raymond. Don't worry. About it. <laughs> so I went on and when I retired in 1674, they came to me to do a picture called Farewell, My Lovely with Robert Mitchum. Yeah. And, uh, and I looked around. I owned a couple of construction companies and I was shooting pool in a bar when I had, an, I had an agent in San Diego. I did a lot of commercials when I was California heavyweight champion. And uh, they, uh, they called me up, they called her up. She called me on the phone. She said, they want you to do this picture, Farewell My Lovely, and I think you should do it. So I went to New York, I met the director and they flew me out to California. I did a screen test and Robert Mitchell said, it's either him or I don't do the movie. And he became like a mentor and he was like a, a father. He was great. And Farewell, My Lovely turned out to be a really, really good film. Yeah. And it was, uh, in fact, I, it was the first mistake I made in the film industry. Mitchum had set up for me to do the Johnny Carson show. And I met Johnny Carson at the Polo Lounge and he said, if you do my show, I'll get you nominated for supporting actor. The film was that good. And I said, uh, your show is live, isn't it? He said, yeah. And I said, uh, I don't think I can do your show. He said, well, what are you talking about? I said, well, I'm going to come on your show and you're going to ask me about my father and I'm going to ask you where the men's room's at. He said, you would get up and leave? I said, yeah. I said, I don't talk about my father and I don't want anybody else talking about him, especially on television. And that was stupid. I should have met him, screamed at me the next day. He said, are you crazy? Hollywood loves that stuff, man. He said, they eat that stuff up every day. What's the matter with you? I said, yeah, you was your big mouth telling people, you know, and he what I should have done. I probably would have won a uh, supporting actor that year for Farewell, My Love. Wow. Then I did King Kong and 
my career just went one film after the other. And we did the Superman movies and we became iconic actors after that, you know? Yes. Superman 1 and 2 were, were yep. great films. And that was, and you play with what, Gene Hackman, Marlon Brando? Yeah, I, I, I did, I did, I tell you, I did pictures with Mitchum, I did pictures with Jimmy Coburn, with Omar Sharif, Marlon Brando, two pictures with Gene Hackman, March or Die, and then we went up and did Superman. And Brando was Brando was brilliant. Brando, Brando knew my father. He couldn't wait to meet me. I, I bet. He was, uh, <laughs> Brando was, uh, Mitchum said to me, I want you to go down and say hello to him, tell him I said hello, but bing, bing, bang. And I went down to the set when the first day, because he, first 11 days they shot Brando to get the money for the film. And I went down when he came off the plane, I went down to see him, he was surrounded by reporters, and he just ran over his, Hey kid, how you doing? I said, yeah. I said I'm good. How you doing? I said, Mitchum says hello. He said, and well, he and I became good friends. Brando was unbelievable actor, just an yeah. amazing individual. Yeah, I, um, I like Brando. He, even in his later years, when he would just pick a film to do here and there, like right up until that film he did with Bob De Niro called The Score. I mean, I I loved him, man. He was a one of a oh, kind he was, actor. He was such a great. He was a phenomenal actor, and he was just. So, you know, Brando was like, Mitchum was the same way. The, these old time actors, when they walked on the set, you could hear a pin drop. Yeah. yeah. You know, people respected them so much and they were there to work and they didn't, it wasn't like a lot of these young kids today that, you know, there was a problem here, a problem there. These guys came to work and they, they, they had a love for the industry. You know, they just, uh, I mean, so, you I get mean guys... That do 200 films, you know, that's a right. lot of movies. Well, speaking on that, like, how was it working on a movie like that where obviously, you know, Christopher Reeve is, you know, the movie's based around him. He's Superman. Um, you guys are the villains. But what was it like in comparison? Because at that time, he was pretty young. And then you got Christopher all was guys. Christopher was a 170-pound weakling when he came on the set. But <laughs> Richard Donner saw something in his face. He had the look that Donner wanted. And they got David Prost was a bodybuilder. who played uh, Darth Vader. Yeah. And David Prost, they got David Prost. They were going to build Christopher up. And I said, told, grab David. And I said, listen, you don't want to pump this kid up. You want to build him like Steve Reeves. You want to cut him. You want to make him defined. And so they put 20 pounds on him and gave great definition. And he looked terrific. You know, but he did a performance of Clark Kent, Superman, that no one will ever do again. And that was all Richard Donner. Richard Donner did that, you know. And what this kid did it was foolish. You know, he was he was young, he was naive, and he became a big star from Superman because of Richard Donner. And when they brought Mr. Lester on the, on the scene because they didn't want to pay – Donner, and they didn't want to pay. In fact, how do you cut Marlon Brando out of a movie? They already paid him, so they didn't want to pay him the points. So they cut him out of two. But if you ever seen the Donner cut, it's all Brando's all in through the Donner cut on the scenes that he was cut out of, and it's a much better picture. But he, um, Christopher should have stood up and said, no Brando, no, no Donner, no me. I won't come back if you don't bring Donner back. And it would have been a whole different franchise. You know, that's the worst mistake that kid made because Donner made his career. I mean, he just, he, 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 he got something out of that kid that no one else would have ever gotten. Yeah. And no one will ever do Clark Kent Superman like he did. No. In fact, we're no. trying to, we're trying right now to get another license to, to bring him back and to bring the three villains back. And, we're going to make the villains turn them around into good guys. They're going to become cohorts of Superman. They'll have an army. Wasn't that, wasn't great, that a plan? A wasn't that a plan uh, back then to do that? Wasn't that somewhat of a plan back then to do that? And they just never. Well, they had a bunch of stuff they were talking about, but they, I've written a treatment that uh, a lot of people like, and we're, we've got the money. We're just trying to get a license from Warner brothers now. And I think we're going to do that. So, and bring Christopher back. You bring Christopher back on the screen. And we want to get away from, you know, the problem with a lot of superhero pictures today is that 
the superheroes are killing as much people as the bad guys do. <laughs> and so we want to change that. We want to take it back to the all American way, the way we did on Superman one and two. Right. And change a lot of that stuff and put some sanity back in entertainment. You know? Did Christopher get along with a lot of people on those sets? He was, Chris was okay. He was naive. You know, and, and like any naive guy who becomes a star overnight, um, even before he became, even before the picture came out, you knew it was going to be a great picture. And, but he, uh, you know, his head got a little bit blown out of proportion, but he, uh, he, he was, he actually didn't become a really nice guy until he got hurt. After he got hurt, he became a whole different person. Wow. And he got hurt because he wouldn't listen to anybody. He was over horse. He didn't have the proper equipment on. And when the horse threw him and he hit his head, you know, the accident happened. And it was very sad because uh, he had a great career going, boy. It was, uh, oh, yeah. I'm thinking I, I, I like Chris. I mean, Chris was, Chris was a bad kid at all. He just, he just, uh, he was naive. You know, he, the only thing he ever did before Superman was love of life. And he did a play where he held a spear for Catherine Hepburn, you know. And so Donner just made his whole day turn right around. Now you go on too, and you work on Dragnet with uh, Tom Hanks and Dan Aykroyd. How fun was that movie? That was a, we had so much fun doing that. <laughs> I bet it was. Now Danny Aykroyd, you I tell you, you could watch Dragnet fifty times, and you still wouldn't get all the one-liners that Danny threw out. And that was a breakout movie for Tom Hanks. Yeah, it was. Uh, and he, I mean, they're both. We 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 had a lot. It was a great cast. We had a lot of fun. It, uh, it it worked well. I thought it was a great little movie. There's some movies that you can watch, even as a, a fan, you know, as a viewer, and you can tell that the guys on that set probably had the, the time of their life filming that movie. It probably wasn't like a job at all. It was just pure fun. And that well, looks like, like Superman. Superman, we, 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 you, you're like a family. Right. When you're working three years on on picture, you know, and we did one, first we did one and two together. And then when they got rid of Donner and they brought Lester on, for Lester to become a director of the film, he had to shoot better than 50% of the picture. Well, Donner had already shot 86% of the picture. So they had to go back and reshoot stuff uh, with Lester as a director. And uh, so we, it was just added another year that we were on the picture. So we were, like together for three years and you, you become like a family, you know? And I mean, Sarah Douglas is a brilliant, she became a very good actress and she was young and uh, Terrence Stamp was a brilliant actor. He was, he was one of the best young actors in England's history. And, and he was a uh, Terrence, Terrence, a great actor, just a, yeah. and a good person. And you had, when you looked at Superman, all those people, like we had the trial scene when we were, in the middle of the rings in Superman one, all those people behind it were all great English actors. You know, you had Harry Anderson, you had, you know, there were so many great actors that did a bit role just right. to be in the movie with Brando, you know, yeah. it was just, it that's, worked out. It was, that's things that somebody with his caliber will bring much like sports. Um, you know, for the Patriots towards the end of their tenure, when they had Tom Brady, you know, a lot of veterans would go there and take less money because they knew they had a good shot at winning a championship ring on the well, way out you, the door. You look at Tom Brady, you know, there's a guy, what a good guy. I mean, yeah. I, I think Tom's one of the cleanest living athletes I ever met. Yeah. And you'll never hear anything derogatory about him on the street or anything. And he, he lives right. He, he eats right. Um, and he should be the highest paid quarterback in the league. And he's like number 13 yeah. because he said, take the money and give me a team. Yeah. Give me the guys up front. That'll keep me from getting hurt. You know, give me some linemen, give me some defense. And he puts the money back into the team. You don't get very many people do that. No. And, it, you... and he's just a, and I've got to tell you something. He's got a great shot this year of winning another ring. Absolutely. You know, I'm sorry to see that Gronk may not come back because he's beat his body up pretty bad. Yeah, yeah. I can understand why he didn't come back, but he still might. You never know. He's well, I'll tell you what. 
That last year they had in New England, if you'd have told me at the beginning of that year, Brady's going to go win the Super Bowl and he's going to do it with Julian Edelman, Danny Amendola, Chris Hogan, Rob Gronkowski. I ain't even sure who the running back was. I know it wasn't nobody spectacular. If you'd have gave me those names and said he's going to go win a Super Bowl against the Atlanta Falcons, I'd have been like, you're crazy. There's no way. And, I mean, <laughs> I just – I don't know how he did. He just done it year after year. And that's the mark of, you know, when teams sometimes hit that peak, you know, they get popular and then guys go away. You start to see the quarterback not be able to do what they could do years prior. But Brady did it year in, year out, no matter who they took away, what they gave him. If Even the years when he had, like, Randy Moss, they didn't win the Super Bowl. They fell short against the Giants. But, you know, it didn't matter who you gave him. It, they didn't need to be fast. They didn't need to be, you know, super tall. I mean, he just worked with whatever they gave him. He was Tom. Tom is an offensive machine. Yes. And he's, and, it, and again, you're talking about a guy who clean lives and lives, eats, and sleeps the game. Yeah. He, and he knows every inch of that field. He knows. He, I mean, he's just an offensive machine. You know, he was linked up with a coach. Who's a defensive genius? Yeah, and Belichick's a defensive guy. Brady had a, an offensive coach that he coordinated with really well, and and he listened and learned, and he just got better and better and better because he became a student of the game. Mm -hmm. But he was a student of life. Yeah, he lived. You don't find many athletes. And I've known a lot of great athletes, and not very many of them ever live like this kid lives. No, nah, I agree. 100%. And he still does. And, and he didn't worry about the money. Cause I think, I think Giselle makes more money. Than he does. Anyway. I, yeah. I think, I think she does. It's, that's just spending money. Whatever he makes for the year. Yeah. <laughs> that's <laughs> the, uh, money know, or boat money. <laughs> he's got a good shot this year. of winning the ring again. Yeah. I tell you. No, I believe they, that they, 100%. This, this, this guy that's good. Take it over as coach. He was a great defensive coach. And he's letting Brady have his head on offense where he argued with Arian all the time. Yeah. And he's not going to have that problem this year. So he's got a good shot. And he, they, they're giving him some ball players. He's got some good ball players down there. Absolutely. So it should be, it should be an interesting year, actually. So on your book, when did what year did you write your book, Family Legacy? Uh, I wrote it back 10 years ago. Now I, we, we waited. I've got two more books getting ready to come out and we just, I, I wouldn't let a deal get done. I was going to do a movie and there's just too much material. So what we're going to wind up doing is a mini series that'll turn into a series. Okay. And I've got two more books coming out that are going to do follow-ups and, uh, the series will run for a long time. I mean, now is this going to chronicle like you or the mob or, or what exactly? Well, we're going to tell the truth about the. We're going to my life as a young person and coming into something, and uh, and watching the changes that happened. Right. And we're going to talk about how the drug business influenced things, uh, how certain things changed and why they changed, and uh, we're going to tell the truth about uh, a lot of changes that happened. You know, and people. There's a lot of questions that people want answers to, and we're going to give them. We're going to tell, talk about Jimmy Hoffa was a good friend of mine. And then I know where Hoffa's at, and he's not buried anywhere. And, you know, like they just did the picture of the Irishman. Yes. And the Irishman was total bollocks. Um, Frank, I knew this, you know, he, he didn't kill Hoffa, and he never killed Joey Gallo. So they're, they're too far with the movie. Hollywood takes its liberties. You understand? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I, I, in fact, have a show about that right now that I'm doing is kind of a, a side to this podcast, and it's called Behind the Gangster. And what it is is I talk to people who's either closely related to or have, you know, very knowledgeable on people that have been tr portrayed on film, real-life characters I'm talking about, and we yeah. compare and contrast real life as opposed to the liberties that Hollywood takes because sometimes they take them drastic. And you, you mentioned the Irishman. I've talked to a bunch of people. I've talked to a lot of mob guys and, and every one of them said that he didn't do 
Neither one of those. By well, I knew large, Frank Phelan well. Frank Phelan, he he worked for a guy out in Western Pennsylvania. You talking Frank Sharon? Huh? You Frank Sharon? You mean? Frank Sharon. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Frank Sharon, Frank Sharon is uh was uh he whacked a few people, but he worked for Russell Buffalino. Right. And he was a driver for Russell Buffalino, and his brother Billy, who was the lawyer. And uh, Russell was a serious, serious guy. Yeah. And I liked Russell. Russell was a good friend. And Russell was probably one of the most influential in Washington. He was very close to a lot of things going on in Washington. So Sharon uh, was from Philly. And he, uh, he, he, he was a half-assed tough guy. He was what you call a wannabe. Mm -hmm. uh, but he never killed Jimmy Hoffa. And he never... And he never killed Joey Gallo, you know. Uh, so they, oh. that was all Hollywood malarkey, you know. They, of all the people that I've talked to, one of them being a, a pretty, is about as big a hop expert as you can get, a guy by the name of Scott Bernstein, who's done a ton of documentaries and stuff on Hoffa. He seems to be under the impression that Sally Bugs was the one that pulled the trigger. Now, nobody, I think, is 100% on what happened after the fact. Um, well, I, I was kind of. I can tell you, we, we talked to Hoppe as he was going away. Jimmy was Jimmy was a man's man. Jimmy Hoppe would never ask you to do what he couldn't do himself. Right. And he made some bad mistakes. And when they, when they charged him with saying that he took $8,000 from the union to fix his house, that's all bogus because, number one, there was no pension fund until Hoppe came in. Hoffa created the pension fund, okay? Number two, if Hoffa had work to be done in his house, guys would have lined up to do it for nothing. Yeah. You understand me? That's because he was loved that much. And when he went to, and then he, he backed the wrong president. And he politically, he made some bad moves. And Kennedy hated him because he controlled so much vote. The Teamsters were huge. and. Yeah. Jimmy controlled a lot of votes, so they they put up a bogus charge on him. He thought he was only going to go away for a couple months. We were in Boston talking to him as he was getting ready to go into Lewisburg, and the trucks lined up all the way up to the prison, pulling their horns. This country came to a standstill that day. All the Teamster drivers were standing there, following him all the way right to the door of the prison. And he wound up staying there a few years, you know, and then he, he signed a very bad deal to get out. And he signed it because he wanted out and, mm -hmm. and, and and he got home and he walked into Fitzsimmons office and he threw him out. And he said, this is my union. I'm taking it back. And they said, Jimmy, you can't, you just signed a document that you weren't allowed to touch the union for X amount of time, blah, 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 blah. And you can't do this. And, but Simmons was already bought and they, they scared him because they blew up a car next to his kid's car and put the fear of God in him. And they were hitting him for money and borrowing. And, and one of the things when Hoffa was, when Hoffa was there and, and, and the mob borrowed money from the Teamsters pension fund, they paid every dime of it back. They borrowed money for Vegas. They, they bought Caesar's Palace, 25 million. They did certain things, but they paid every loan back. And he was home. He got a phone call from New York. And he was on the phone with a guy from New York, a serious, serious guy. And uh, Jimmy kept saying, I want my union back. They said, Jimmy, take your time. We'll work it out. You can't be in that office. Just abide by the thing for a period of time. We'll work. We'll fix it. Don't worry about it. I don't get I want my union. I want it now. He was ranting and raging, and and then he, you know, he said, "When you people wanted to borrow money, I gave you whatever." And they they said, "Jimmy, you're on the telephone. Just bide your time." No, I don't want to hear this. I don't want to hear it. And he got really mad, and he was frustrated. And, and the last thing he said was, "I'll go to the newspapers." And the guy in New York hung the phone up, and that was the end of Jimmy Hoffa. Wow. And they took care of business and. Uh, and he's not buried anywhere. I can guarantee you that. Well, so if he's exactly not, if he's not buried, but you're, you're alluding to the, the movie is inaccurate as, as a way of how they got rid of him. I was thinking that 
at least the how they got rid of him could explain why he's never been found. Because, you know, a lot of things that I've learned, especially with doing a lot of research on the mob, is people usually always talk. Bodies usually always get discovered, especially when people turn or become mm-hmm. informant. That's never happened with Jimmy. So to me, I'm no, thinking because, he's got to be put yeah. somewhere where he will never, ever be found or either completely got never be up. found. Uh, I tell you what, he's not buried anywhere. And he'll never be found. And he wasn't cremated. Um, and I, <laughs> when we do, when we do family legacy, I'm going to tell where he's at and how, what happened to him, but his kid is great. His kids running the teamsters now. Yeah. Um, yeah. things are, you know, Jimmy was, uh, Jimmy, Jimmy was his own worst enemy, unfortunately. And, and it was, and it was very sad, uh, how he, his demise came, you know, yeah, it was. I can assure you. They're never, I'll tell you a fact, I'll tell you a funny story. There's a guy in Chicago who, uh, his father had a, a gentleman farm right outside of Chicago in the suburb. And this guy used to go out and till it every year for his dad, turn the ground over and everything. So they got locked up, he was in jail. And his forefather was old and sick and, and, the, and the farm had to be tended to. So he told the FBI Hoffa was buried on his father's farm. And they went and dug the whole farm. <laughs> they, they dug up, they turned it all over to turn all the ground over and everything. Of course, they never found Hoffa. He wasn't there. But, they, you know, I laughed my ass off. I remember when they, oh. when they did that. You know, it's just, uh, Jimmy was, Jimmy was, uh, I mean, I did some things with Jimmy in Philly, breaking strikes and stuff like that and, uh, down on the waterfront. Jimmy Hoffa was a man's man. I mean, he was just a great individual. And he took guys, when he when he got involved in the Teamsters, these guys were working 18-hour days. They loaded the trucks and unloaded the trucks, and they got paid little money, and he turned that all around to where lawyers and people were quitting their jobs to drive a truck over the road because they all they had to do was hook up to a trailer drop the trailer off, but they were out in the fresh air driving, making serious money, you know, yeah. by his drivers. And he did that. He he turned all that around and he did great things for the unions. And they, uh, the Kennedys went after him big time. They they just, uh, he could, they were scared of him because he controlled too much vote. Yeah. I mean, definitely a powerful guy. So you, you think that whole, the Irishman movie, probably that whole thing is pretty false. Not very much well, of it true at all. It was a laugh. I, I mean, it, I mean, they did a great job of, of making making De Niro and everybody younger looking and stuff yeah. like that. You know, and the actors did a great job, but yeah, it was the, the story was total bogus. Yeah, I tell people that. I knew Sheeran well. Like, I had a confrontation with Sheeran. Oh God, when I was boxing, I was owned by the, the, there was a man called Sam So <laughs> Sam Margolis. And Blinky Palermo ran boxing out of Philly. They controlled Liston and several other fighters. They was my management crew, part of it. And uh, there was a, a there was a, a restaurant bar downtown Philadelphia that they used to have big meetings at. And there were a lot of head Jewish people, Italian people, all the certain groups that l- met one day. And Sheeran was there trying to act like a, 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 a getting very salty with some very serious Jewish people. And I grabbed a hold of him and, and I took him outside. And, and uh, thank God one old man, Meyer said, Jack, don't, he's not worth, he's not worth it. Just get, just tell him to go home. And so I had a confrontation with him and sent him home. But he was, uh, Frank was a good guy. Just, he, he was just too big for his britches, you know? Yeah. So and they did a book, paint you paint houses. Yeah, I heard you paint he houses. He whacked yeah. a few people. He whacked a couple of people. He did do that, but he was basically a driver for Buffalino. Wow. You know, and, and Russell, Russell was a clever guy. Getting on the boxing for a minute, you know, there's often been, you know, rumors that the you know the mob control, like you said, a lot of fighters, but they also fixed a lot of fights. Listen, being the, the subject of well, some of those. What do you if know about Frankie that? Carbo? If Frankie Carbo would have been out of jail, I would have been heavyweight champ of the world. 
Let me tell you that, you know, and because I would have trained, you know, I, I, I took fights on a, on a week's notice, on four days notice. And, 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 and I got to a point where I didn't really want the publicity of being this real white hope guy that they made me out to be. You know, like I, I'll give you a good example. I was in New Jersey, living in New Jersey, and we were under indictment for four or five union things. And they called me up to fight Kenny Norton. And uh, I, was, I, I, was, I was locked in my house and I was out running every day. So I was in pretty good shape. And they called me and said, will you fight Ken Norton? I said, when? They said, next week. I said, send me a ticket. I said, you'll take the fight? I said, send me. I wanted to get out of New Jersey. I wanted to get away from the problem. And, and I went out and fought Norton with a week's, week's training under my belt. And... Uh, and I actually beat the hell out of them. But <laughs> what they did was in the ninth round, Norton was owned by two millionaires in, in, in San Diego, Bob Byron and Art Rifkin. And uh, in the ninth round, we were standing toe to toe and I had cut him up pretty bad. I, I, we were beating him pretty handily, I thought. And they, uh, in the ninth round, people were standing on the chair screaming because it was a great fight. He was a hell of a fighter. And they finally, they had to ring the bell three times before they finally heard it. And they, when the referee separated us and I was going back to my corner, he ran across the ring and hit me behind the head and drove me into the ring post. And Joey Almas, the commissioner was sitting right at ringside by my corner. They jumped up in the corner and he said, if you can't continue, you just won the fight on a foul. And I should have sat right there on the stool but like a dummy, I'm in his hometown. I said, I'm going to kill this guy. <laughs> so mad. And, and I went out in the 10th round and we finished the 10th round and he got a decision. But I won the city, people, because that, they knew that I beat him. And, and but I stayed there and I knocked out a half dozen guys and, and won the California heavyweight title. I fought a guy no one wanted to fight, Henry Clark from San Francisco, who was ranked number three in the world. And I beat him for the California Heavyweight Championship. So and then I was, the Blue Lewis fight was another contender that I knocked out. Yeah. And then they called me up to go to fight. Uh, they, they, they were looking for a white guy to fight Joe Frazier in Houston, Texas. So the guy, uh, what's his name, Vescuzzi, the trainer called me and said, you want to fight Terry Daniels in Houston, Texas? I said, send me a ticket. He said, you take the fire. I said, send me a ticket. So I flew down to Houston. And I got off the plane. And he said, damn, man, you're in great shape. I said, well, aren't you supposed to be in shape when you come to a fight? <laughs> <laughs> and I destroyed this kid. I knocked him out in three rounds. They should have stopped it. And he was ranked like number five in the world. And I flew back to Philadelphia with Yank Durham on the plane. And he looked at me and he said, uh, he said, uh, if you beat one more good fighter, you can have the Frazier fight. I said, I'll tell you what, you pick the time and the place, send me a ticket. He said, are you kidding me? I said, what did I just tell you? You pick the fighter and the time, just send me a ticket. So they called me up a week and a half later, two weeks later, and said, you fight Cleveland Williams in Houston, Texas? I said, when? Send me a ticket. So I went down to Houston, and that was Cleveland's hometown. He was another world ranked fighter. Cleveland was a tough guy, pretty good fighter. And, and I beat him bad. And uh, nobody would fight me again. All of a sudden, Terry Daniels got the Frazier fight and Cleveland Williams fought, Zora, fought uh, George Savallo on the same card. So I, and I wound up in Palookaville and no one wanted to fight me. <laughs> Who's so, the toughest guy you ever fought? I tell you, the, I think the hardest hitting guy was 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 Williams. When Cleveland Williams could punch, and he thank God I was in great shape. He hit me in the third round with a left hook, and I I felt it in my toes. I mean, I mean, I I, I fell back into the corner, and he came charging. So I thumbed him and cuffed him and spun him around. I whispered in his ear, "I said, you're never touching me the rest of this night, old man." <laughs> and I gave him a boxing lesson. And, after the fight, he said, you got the greatest left hand ever since from Ali down. You're, you, you're, you had a good, because I had a pretty good jab and I could jab and hook and stuff. 
I could box. I could fight. Did you ever have to use those fighting moves on anybody in the movie industry? Did anybody want to try you? Nobody's that foolish. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's that foolish. I tell you, I had, you know, they, they often, a lot of times people talk about the argument that I had with Christopher Reeve. Right. And, and uh, they blow it way out of proportion. There's a, a great restaurant in London called the San Lorenzo, with a beach and place, which is a, uh, was the first really good Italian restaurant in London. It was owned by friends of mine. And uh, I used to take everybody, I used to tell them, you know, go in to hack. Everybody used to go in there to eat. And I used to eat my dinner there every night because I lived down the street in Cadogan Square. And Lorenzo called me on the phone one day. He said, Jack, how well do you know this Christopher Reeve kid? I said, well, I work with him. I said, I don't know him other than the fact that we're doing a picture together. He said, well, he's in here talking about New York and your father and you and organized crime and a lot of things I don't think he should be talking about. Ooh. So the next morning I went to work and I grabbed him and I took him in a room and I said, uh, you know, uh, how well do you know me, young man? He said, well, I, I hear stories about it. I said, well, next time you mention my name, say Mr. in front of it. If you ever talk about my father again, you won't be doing any movies anymore. And he, so we had a serious understanding. And then we left and went out in the hallway where there was a lot of people. And all of a sudden he became Superman. He said, you can't talk to me that way, blah, blah, blah. And I said, what did you, I, what did you, so I grabbed him and I put him up against the wall and I was just about ready to smack him. And Richard Donner jumped up in my ear and said, not in the face, Jack. Not in the face. So, that's what I did. I busted out laughing. It wasn't the last you. I dropped them on the floor and I said, "Son, you don't know how lucky you are." And I walked away. And we, you know, it was disgruntled for a while, but you know, he, he was all right. The kid was all right. He was just naive. He was just a naive kid. Yeah, because if you'd have blacked his eye, I'd have pushed shooting back a couple weeks for it to heal. <laughs> <laughs> well, Donner was. Donner thought I was going to bang. Oh, my God. He was scared to death. Not in the face, John. I laughed like hell. I said, you what? know, Dick, you saved that kid's life. He said, don't you? I saved my picture. He said, thank you very much. You mentioned earlier, we're talking about Hoffman, you know, the Teamsters. And it's crazy of how many things, kind of like your, your, your life story, how many directions you spawned off on. Like how many things that the mob got involved in during that period of time? I mean, you know, they helped get Kennedy in the white house, you know, then the Marilyn Monroe got taken out all this time. Like you said, Hoffa, well, you know, set those guys you, up in casino. I mean, you got to, you have to, you, you got to understand something. You go back, you go back to, to 1900, you know, uh, when the Italians came into the country uh, in the beginning, they were all partners. Yeah. Organized crime, government, police, they were all partners because there was the word drugs involved. You gambling they allowed. You know, they loan sharking, gambling and stuff like that. They so they, they were pretty close. They 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 watched after each other. Neighborhoods were protected better. There was a lot of different things happened, you know. When I was a kid and I was raised in Philadelphia, we never locked our front door. Yeah. Nobody ever robbed any cars in our neighborhood. You understand? Certain things were, neighborhoods were looked after better. When when old timers lived in, in their neighborhood, that neighborhood, you wouldn't dare commit a crime. Yeah, self so, And the things started changing, you know, and, and, and the changes came and uh, you watch things dissipate. And when the drug business came, and, and they all, Frank Costello said the same thing. He said, you know, and Frank had a book, a political book that you could choke on. I mean, he was connected to every senator, I yeah. mean, all the way up to the White House. And the Kennedy thing, when Jack Kennedy was running for president, Meyer Lansky said to Gene Connor, why are you pushing us to back Jack Kennedy? We already own Nixon. What do we need Kennedy for? And he said, because you got to go back to the beginning. Joe Kennedy was, Joe Kennedy was 
one of the brightest bankers that ever came into America. Very, very smart guy, okay? His father-in-law was Honey Fitzgerald. He was a gangster from Ireland who came to Boston, made a lot of money, dug out the harbor. He controlled all the liquor from Scotland and, and, and all the booze he controlled coming into the country. And he owned the Bank of Boston. And he was uh, first senator up there. And he made Joe Kennedy, when Joe Kennedy married his daughter, he made him president of, a, he was the youngest president of a bank. And when the prohibition came, Joe Kennedy and a guy from Newark, New Jersey that owned Fleischmann's Liquor opened up a, a factory up in Canada and they were bootlegging because the old man gave them all the liquor from Scotland. They took it up into Canada and they were bringing it down into America. And down in 19, uh, in, in the beginning of the middle of the prohibition, there was a load of booze that was coming down into Detroit from Kennedy's warehouse up there that belonged to the Purple Gang. And Joe Kennedy hijacked it to give it to somebody else because at the last moment, somebody paid him more money. Well, the Purple Gang was nobody to play with. Right. I don't know if you ever heard of them, but I have. there were a group of Jewish guys that were stone killers. And they said to Joe Kennedy, you're a dead man, sunshine. And he ran back home to Honey Fitzgerald. And uh, his father-in-law said, I can't help you with these guys. You got a problem. So he said, the only guy that can help you is in Chicago. So he went to Chicago to sit down with the first Don out there. Joe Esposito, and he sat down and Joe Esposito said, you know what, kid? You're a great earner. You go back to Boston. I'll take care of the Purple Gang, but you belong to me now. And he was under thumb, and he didn't like that at all. And there was a political club in Chicago called the Hamilton Club, which everybody hung out in politically. And Joe Kennedy, the only money he ever put into a building in America is the is the mercantile building downtown Chicago. They made him build that. And 1920, he they sent him out to Hollywood. He got involved with Randolph Hearst and he got involved in Hollywood and he was chasing every starlet in the world. And if you took RKO pictures and you went down underneath the paperwork, he put together all the Jewish theater owners and put the first distribution deal together. Joe Kennedy did that. He was very, very bright. He was a bright guy. And 1927, 26 into 27, the Hamilton Club guy sat him down and they said, we want you to do something for us. And he stole $5 million from Pathé Newsreel in broad daylight. No one ever saw it. He did a stock swap thing, bam, bam, boom, smooth as a baby. And they said, that's excellent. Now this is what we really want you to do. Because you have to understand, after World War I, America got into war-bearing equipment, manufacturing, preparing for World War II. They were building ships, doing all kinds of things. And they were taking jobs away from Europe. And the Europeans were angry because they financed America. Right. And they weren't getting their money back as readily as they thought they should or with the interest rate. So these guys told Joe Kennedy, they wanted him, what they did was he created a short sell, which was aimed at 30 companies in Europe. And one of them was a Rothschild company that was run by Blackjack Bovier, who was Jackie Kennedy's father. And the short sell was working and working well and they took off uh, for a weekend. They came back the following week to start again. The country had panicked and the crash happened. They didn't do it deliberately to cause the crash. It just happened. But it made them more money because of the right. crash. And after that crash settled down, they went to, Roosevelt went to Kennedy and said, you know what, kid? You did such a great job for us. We're now going to make you head of the SEC because you're going to have to rewrite all the laws because 
Europe had to reinvest back into the country to get their money back. And the company, the Blackjack Bouvier, went bankrupt with a Rothschild company. He drank himself to death. Her father over that came a bad alcoholic and died. And the mother groomed her daughter to Mac Jack Kennedy to marry him because she wanted her money back. You understand? Yeah. She married another stockbroker guy that they never they never lived badly. They lived out in Long Island. But the bottom line was at the end of the day, at the end of 1935, Joe Kennedy was done everything that the SEC was asked to do. They said, you did a great job. Now we're going to make you ambassador to England. And he went to England and we weren't in the war yet. You're talking 1935. And before he went, some people from Chicago grabbed him and said, there's some friends of ours over there. We want you to melt some things together. Well, the first guy he was introduced to was a Shah of Iran who was a gangster. So they put, Joe Kennedy was a greedy guy. So they put together an arms deal and they were selling arms to Hitler. And then Hitler came back to the same crew and they had a guy named Khashoggi and they were selling weapons and everything to him, okay? That England ever. said, hey man, you're aiding our enemy. What the hell do you think you're doing? And he said, well, America's not in the war. I'm not, he's no, no, no. So they threw him out of England, but nobody ever knew why, because the Gore family owned the newspapers on the East Coast. They were in Indiana. Hearst had newspapers on the West Coast. There was no television. The radio stations were owned by the Murchison family out of Texas. So no one ever said a word as to why he was thrown out of Europe. He came back to America as Ambassador Joe Kennedy. Wow. You understand that? If you ever read your history books, you, that's what you'll see. Came back as ambassador. So he wanted his first son to be president. Young Joe Kennedy was a great pilot, big time war guy. He had 14 days before he came out of the service. The, the financial, the bankers of Geneva were putting a plan together to fly a kamikaze plane into the German manufacturing munition factories to end the war. And they convinced him to test pilot this plane. And he got in the plane and test pilot, the plane blows up, Joe Kennedy's dead. First son gone. Now they turn around and they scrap the whole deal a week later. That whole plan was all scrapped. Now the second son he's going to run, Jack Kennedy, and he's going to run it for president. People said, "What do we need Jack Kennedy for? We got Ray, we got Nixon, blah blah blah." So the 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 he wasn't nominated yet. So the they're coming out to California for the nomination. Joe Kennedy told Gene Connor, "Well, I got the electoral votes in hand. Don't worry about it. We'll get nominated." And they get in two days into the nomination thing in California. And uh, Joe Kennedy calls up Chicago and says, I got a problem. We don't have the electoral votes we thought we had. So all of a sudden, Illinois and two other states turned Democrat for the very first time in their history. And on the, the third day, Joe calls up. He said, we still need... And there's only one state that can really carry us right across the border into him being nominated. And that was West Virginia for a little state. They had a lot of electoral votes because of the coal, coal and mining, a lot of money there. Mm -hmm. So they called the Cellini family and Meyer, who owned a lot of casinos in West Virginia, and some debt was excused. And West Virginia raised their hand, and Jack Kennedy gets nominated for president. Joe Kennedy, in the meantime, sends a satchel full of money out to, or no, the people in Texas send the satchel of money out to Kennedy to get Johnson to run as vice president. Yeah. And uh, Jack Kennedy now is running for president. So it's a neck and neck vote with him and Nixon. Right. You know, like all the stuff that just happened with all these fixed votes and all. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. 
let me tell you something. When Nixon and Kennedy were running for president, there were sections of Illinois that people voted 20 times and they were dead. And he won by a very slim margin. Yeah, I remember that and was no a real slim question. margin. Nobody ever questioned it when he became president. So as soon as he became president, his father said to him, make your brother Bobby, because the first thing Meyer Lansky said is, what are you going to do with this clown Bobby? And Gene Connor was told, oh, they're going to make Bobby ambassador to Ireland to get him out of the country, because he was already a thorn in people's sides. Yeah. With commissions in New York. So he tells Jack, make your brother Bobby attorney general. And he whispers in Bobby's ear, put all my good friends in jail, including Gene Connor, who just got his son elected president. Put all my good friends in jail. And Bobby Kennedy went after everybody. Yeah? Yeah, with the RICO so law. <clears throat> they went, the RICO and the two other laws, they, they went after everybody. And it, so they, now, now, now the, the things, now he turns around and whispers in Jack's ear, he said, see those guys down there in Texas? That all those oil guys that are making all that money down there? He said, uh, they have a product called surplus oil that they pay no tax on. You want to levy a tax on that oil. So Jack Kennedy turns around and puts a tax deal out. That cost those people two to three hundred million dollars a year. Think they were a little bit angry? So now he's got he's got the oil people in Texas angry, the Teamsters are angry, the mafia is angry, the CIA is angry because of what he did at the Bay of Pigs. Mm -hmm. And the Bay of Pigs, Joe Kennedy told Jack, none of those soldiers should have any bullets in their rifles because you don't want any any incidents to happen to cause a problem, and they all got slaughtered. They couldn't even defend themselves. They were like sitting ducks being yeah. shot. So the CIA wasn't too happy with Joe Kennedy because Joe Kennedy had a deal going with Cuba. You understand? Wow. So now they turn around at the end of the day, you come down to Jack Kennedy's going down to Texas and uh, he's already dying. He wasn't going to live out his, his whole term because he had Addison's disease, which is deterioration of your back. He had syphilis and two other diseases. They used to shoot him up every day for the pain. And his father would rather see him die the way he died than him die from a medical cause, which would put a black mark on the family. Now you would say, Geez, that's kind of crazy, man. Why would you think something like that? Look what he did to his daughter. His daughter suffered from ADD. He lobotomized her. His daughter sat in an institution looking out a window all her life. Did you know that? No, I did not. Look it up. Kennedy's daughter, Joe Kennedy's daughter, sat in an institution all of her life because she suffered from ADD before doctors knew what to do with it. And he was afraid she'd jump up on tables and crack crazy and get nuts in front of diplomats and all the other stuff. So he lobotomized her and put her in an institution, right? Jack Kennedy is going to drive down Dealey Plaza in an open car. The Bird Building had the windows open, people walking around with the President of the United States below it. Now, Bobby Kennedy was his second skin his whole political career. He's the number one cop in the country. Four people went to see him, one of them being Adlai Stevenson, to say, do not let your brother go to Texas. The animosity is horrendous. Bobby didn't go before. He wasn't there during, and he never went afterwards. Okay? The Dealey Plaza route took him six months to reroute it. For him to go down Dealey Plaza in an open car with all these people walking around the building, people getting off for of the train, all these hobos that they locked up coming over that bridge where the car had to go under, one of them being Woody Harrelson's father, who was a hitman for New Orleans. Okay? Yeah, he, he shot were, a judge later on too, didn't he? Well, yeah, there, there were 13 shots fired that day. And 13. 13 shots were fired that day. 
Jack don't... Kennedy was hit three times. First time he got hit in the throat, okay, where you see him grab his throat yeah. and he falls forward. And then he got shot in his lower back that they didn't talk about for 10 years after. And the driver turned and took the third shot. When you see him, he goes backwards and the back of his head flies out. Okay. Now, how are you getting the back of his head to fly out when the guy's behind him supposedly shooting him from a window, which Lee Harvey Oswald was not even in the building. There was a prison right across from the bird building. And these guys are looking straight in that window. And there's two dark complected guys and one white guy. Three guys were in the window. And they had a mail order rifle. Now, if you know anything about shooting, you got a mail order bolt action rifle. Okay. Now, if I'm a shooter and I have a target a thousand miles away, I have to first of all arrest my heart, which takes 60 seconds because my pulse is in my finger, mm-hmm. right? And that's on the trigger. Secondly, you had wind variables, the cars going on a decline. You had trees, signs, all these variables you have to take into consideration. Yeah. And the wind was so bad that none of the police could understand anything on their microphones because of bad, derelish wind. Stuff. So three shots, the guy is a bolt action. So you're going to tell me that he shoots three times with a bolt action rifle with 28 seconds of shooting. Three bullets in 28 seconds of any effectiveness? Forget about it. All they did was make a noise from the window. Yeah. Johnny Roselli was in a cauldron in the street on the right-hand side. You know what a cauldron is? Yeah. In the street curve. Yeah. That cauldron went to the river, from the river to the street, and it was big enough for me to walk down. That's how big it was. Roselli took the first shot from there, hit him in the throat. Second shot was came from the from the from the plot from the the, the crowd that hit him in the lower back, and the driver took the third shot that shot him and pushed his head back. Now the Zabruder film, which Zabruder never held a camera before in his life, suffered from vertigo. Two women were holding his legs while he was up on the air, up on the high pallet so he could see, never took his finger off of the trigger of the camera for 28 seconds shooting that footage that was sold to Life Magazine for $150,000 before it was ever shot, okay? But there were eight frames cut out of it which showed the, the driver turning and shooting. But they were at it, they were, it's been since, been put on YouTube and stuff like that. It wow. shows the driver actually turn and take the last shot. Jackie Kennedy, now if you if you watch the Zabruder film, you see all the Secret Service guys had fallen back behind Kennedy's car because they didn't want to be in line of the bullets that were going to fly in there. You see them all running up to catch the car after the bullets were shot and Jackie's coming out and they said, oh, she's trying to scrape his brains up well, that's a bunch of shit. They grabbed her off the car and said, if you say one word about what you just saw, we'll kill your kids. And she oh. never, ever uttered a word. But she kept a diary, which got her son killed. Because Jack the kid Jr. ran G Magazine. He was going to take, when his mother died, he got his hands on her diary. He was coming to Hollywood to make a movie. And when he went to take that plane to go over to the to the resort there from New York, he first of all the plane was rigged, but he he wasn't qualified to fly in the storm anyway. He was two hours late. They should have never let him take off from that airport. And the plane crashed and he's dead. So you're saying that had a direct result from the diary. That she kept oh, yeah. that he had possession of. Oh, he was coming to Hollywood to make a movie. That wasn't they were never gonna let that happen. So are you Same saying Marilyn Monroe? Are you, you saying, at Marilyn Monroe? Are you saying real quick, I wanna I wanna clarify something real quick. Are you saying that Joe basically had his son whacked? I mean, at the end of the day, he set it up for him to get whacked and uh, Bobby knew it? He, he, no, Joe Joe didn't do any precautions to stop him from going there with open windows at all. Okay. He would have rather seen him die the way he died. It wasn't him. 
it was orchestrated by the by the bankers of Geneva. It was the guy who orchestrated the Dealey Plaza deal was a guy called the Jackal, Carlos Sanchez. Carlos Sanchez orchestrated that hit. It was the first hit he ever orchestrated in America. He was the premier assassin from Europe. Wow. He's supposed to be sitting in jail in France. He's down on his father's French down in South America. He's never went to jail. Wow. That was not him. That's not him sitting in jail in France. He was the cleverest of, this guy was so clever. He used to travel around like a priest. No one ever saw him. He never talked on the phone. He would, he would sit in a confessional and you would be on the other side of the thing talking to him. He never looked him face eye to eye. They put money in the bank. He took care of the hits. And he did that all through Europe. Wow. The Jack. Now, you mentioned Marilyn a minute ago. Obviously, everybody knows Marilyn Monroe, a lot of her story. Whole farce. Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn Monroe loved Jack Kennedy. Mm -hmm. She screwed Bobby Kennedy. Yeah. Okay. And while she was having an affair with Bobby Kennedy, she was drinking a lot. She was doing a lot of crazy stuff. Sam Jean Connor took her up to Tahoe. Cal and, Neva? Uh, yeah, he took her to Cal Neva because he owned it. He took yeah. her for the weekend. And she blah, 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 because she was drinking, doing pills. And he said, this lady's got to die. And they wanted her diary. But she kept a diary. And what happened, the reason why she went off the, off the ledge was that she had like 11 abortions. Everybody knocked her up. She was, you know, and when she got pregnant with Bobby, she called, she told him that she was pregnant. All of a sudden he cut her off. She couldn't reach him. All the phones would change. She couldn't, she, so she started drinking, bop, bop, bop and got crazy and stuff. And uh, they put a suppository in her. And That's when they took her out of the house, they, they, they took her out of the house to the hospital. She was already dead. But they gave them a window. They were looking for the, the book, her diary. She and Connors people went in there looking for the diary, and it was already gone. They went to Europe, and <coughs> it's with was with uh, J. Edgar Hoover's partner. He took the book to do. If, they did, if, if, if Kennedy would have been reelected, Hoover would have been out of a job. Right. Now, it's been long since, I guess, uh, rumored that, well, Bobby Kennedy was supposed there. There was a cop that apparently, I guess, pulled him over that <coughs> after they left. So Bobby Kennedy was there. I think Peter Lawford supposedly Peter was there. Peter Lawford was sitting on her bed. They were there sitting on her bed. <clears throat> when she died, they, they they put a suppository up her butt, and that's what killed her. Wow. So she what didn't know that she was... We just knock she, her out and died. put it up her butt? <clears throat> Pardon? They just knocked her out and then put it up her butt? No, she was drunk. Oh, okay. Passed out. She was drunk. And they it wasn't Bobby and Peter Lawford. They came after it was already done. She and Connor did it. Oh, okay. They, they, put, they, put, they put the suppository in her. Because they wanted the diary, but they never found it. And then there was a, uh, they, they owned the cop that went in there looking for it. And it was not there. It was already gone. Wow. They went to Europe. And it's been sitting in Europe ever since. So it's going to surface one day. One day it'll surface. Giancana was one of those guys that just held a lot of secrets on a lot of people. Um, Sam, he, he, Sam yeah. was an incredible guy. I like Sam. Yeah, Sam I did was, too. I bought everything that I've read about him. I mean, Sam he was a good guy, but he didn't run Chicago. Chicago was run by Tony Carter. Yeah, Joe Batters. Yeah, Tony Carter. Tony Carter was a super, super guy. I loved him. He was, he was, uh, he's another guy. He was a man's man. Yeah, but he was very clever. He, you know, he only went to jail a very short time. He was, he could never catch him. But the guy that really ran Chicago was uh the other guy was named uh, oh god um he lived in detroit he didn't even live in chicago uh, uh iopa you ain't talking about iopa are you huh 
Not Aupa, right? Joey Aupa? No, 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 no. It's, uh, oh, God, I think it'll come to me. He was. I only met him once. He was. A, he was a good guy, but Ricardo oh, I used to talk to all the time, and uh, he was. Uh, he was a trip. He was. He was. A, I used to. He had a poem in Palm Spring, and uh, I used to go out and see him out there. And we never could talk in his house, and we take a walk outside. He kept pointing to the sky, that they're listening, <laughs> and we had flash paper. So if you wanted to say something to him, you wrote it on flash paper and burned it right on the spot. <laughs> he was that's why he never got caught. He was very clever. He was and I liked him. He was a, he was a he was a good guy. Are you talking he, about the Tokos? Who? The Tokos that lived out in Detroit? I know they're Jack Toko and Oh Jack Alonis. Jack Alonis Jack were good people. They were yeah. good guys. No. This guy was Paul uh Paul um Oh God, Paul! Uh, oh God, I can see his face. But he was the boss. He was the boss. He was just so laid back. You know, you never, no one ever saw him hardly. He was, Paul uh, Rica. Paul Rica. Paul Ricky. Yeah, that's yeah. Him. Paul Ricky. Yeah. yeah, he okay. was the boss. He was the boss of Chicago. Right. And then he. He when he sat back, it was Paul Paul of, DeLuca, but they Paul DeLuca, but they called him Paul Rica. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Paul Rica. Yeah, he was the boss of Chicago, mm-hmm. and with Acara was the active guy that was flying around. They called him Tony Bats. He used to he used to yeah. whack you with a baseball bat. Yeah, and then obviously they, later yeah. on they had the movie Casino film with a lot of those guys from Chicago heading out there to Vegas and and running well, you they, know like they, they, You know, you got to understand that. Vegas changed when Howard Hughes went there. Howard right. Hughes brought brought the government in, and Chicago came in and was running it when all the dons from New York and everybody sold up and went. They they went out in uh, Indio and in California, opened up resorts out there in Palm Springs and stuff like that. And they uh, they got they left Chicago. They left they left Vegas because it was it was over. Vegas was, there was a time Vegas, you wouldn't, you wouldn't think of committing a crime in Vegas. Mm-hmm. There was only one way in and one way out. And the, there was the, the whole shows where people dressed up, it was a class act. It was a whole different, it was a different town all the Yeah. And then Howard Hughes came in and then things got changed and changed and changed. And, and it's, it's all back slot machines now. The, the gaming isn't even the same as it used to be. Yeah. And I mean, I'm still waiting on like good, accurate movies to come out. Like it, like we spoke earlier in the beginning of this interview is so hard because Hollywood takes their liberties. I'm waiting on a movie to follow Charles Lucky Luciano. From what I understand, he was actually in the middle of writing like a memoir or something before he died. Charlie was, Charlie, Charlie, Charlie was, uh, I, I saw Charlie in Naples where, when I was a kid, when I went down to Sicily. I stopped and saw him in Naples and because uh, he he felt bad. He should have gotten involved in my father's thing and he didn't. And my father put him where he was. Yeah. Albert killed like six people that gave Charlie the power that he got. And then when he hit, when Charlie became the head of the commission, he made Albert, he gave Albert a family because Albert whacked a couple people that had a family and he took that over and it was the Anastasia family. And, uh, and Charlie should have intervened when Albert, but they wanted to, they were in the drug, they, you know, Charlie was involved with, you got to understand something where Luciano came from. He, he, was, he was involved with, with Rothstein, Rothschild, Rothstein in the beginning. And they controlled all the brothels. They protected all the brothels. The, the Orientals, the, the Asians had opium dens were all over New York. You could go in and smoke opium in a lot of places. And so they were in the drug business before anybody ever thought about being in, but they were, they were protectors. They weren't actually selling it or anything of that nature. Wow. And, and they got Luciana 
on prostitution because they protected all these brothels. Yeah. And he got hooked in, and that, that's what, when, they, when they went after him in New York to put him away. Uh, and when he was sent out of the country, he never kept, it was, it was the Luciana family became the Genovese family. Mm-hmm. And he never got the name back. Although Charlie faked his death in, at, the, at the airport and he came back into America. He had some plastic surgery done, came back into America. He lived to be 100 years old. Get the fuck out of here. Oh, no, it's true. I got pictures of him. Yeah. He, he was right in New York. Nobody knew it. He was uh, only a couple people knew he was even alive. He uh, at the airport, they faked he faked his death. He had some surgery in Rome and he had a closed coffin deal. Uh, big you know, funeral thing with a closed coffin. And uh, Charlie came back into America under another name. I never heard that before. Lived, and lived to be, uh, and that'll all come out pretty soon. His son's doing a book on his father's life. But, so his uh, son's still living. Was uh, he in Jersey, right? Charlie? No, his son. His son lives. Uh, his son lives in Vegas and in uh, in New York. Okay. He, he lives in Long Island. He lived in Long Island. Okay. But he's wow. uh, he's um, he's a good friend of mine. I talk to him all the time. Yeah, I've talked. Charlie to was him. Ch- Charlie was Charlie was a a, a a powerful guy. But he when he was out of the country. And he was in Italy for so many years, things were taken away. And he went yeah. to Cuba, you know, and Cuba was, you know, this, the Genovese had a stronghold on the drug business. And yeah. you had Don's, you had, you had guys shooting each other over bullshit. And, you know, the things just changed. They, they forgot how to make money. Yeah. They got, they got into girls and drugs, you know. Yeah. There's only so much you can do when you're all the way over there and you can't get back over to the United States. So that makes, well, it's, you know, it's so kind of loses a stranglehold. There's a lot of, there's a lot of things that'll come out about certain things and stuff. But, so when's uh, that coming like out? Charlie. When can we look forward to that? Yeah. The family legacy is going to be a great miniseries. Yeah. When, when you, gonna, you got an expectation of when that's going to come getting out? Ready to, we're getting ready to put it together now. And then I've got two more books. That's going to bring everything to update it right up to today. Uh, wow. we'll do we'll do next book will end with Nick. My first book starts with my father's death and ends with Kennedy's death. We'll tell the truth about it all. And then wow. we're going to go to Nixon's and Watergate stuff and tell the truth about that. And then go from there into where we're at right now. And, and it's just um, very sad. You know, we have a great, great country that we need to take back. Absolutely. You understand? America's got to stand up and take its country back. Yeah, we're, I agree. We're allowing, we're allowing people to lead us into socialism, and that's garbage. Yeah, no, I agree. It's a, it's in bad shape, and I look around and all this crazy shit that's going on. I mean, things that even really get me going is like that. that it was a guy, the swimmer, Leah Thompson, whatever his name is, and he – he transgendered over to a girl, and now he's nominated for fucking NCAA Female Athlete of the Year. I'm like, if this fucking, I'm calling him a guy because that's what he is. If this fucking guy wins Female Athlete of the Year, I'm going to give up hope for humanity. That's a slap in the face for every female athlete that's busted their ass, worked their ass off, dedicated time, effort, and, and everything they have to a sport, and they just get shitted on by this guy because he... He couldn't cut it in the men's is basically what the fuck happened. He was like 128th every time he swam. Now he, you yeah. know, claims to be a woman, slaps on a pair of tits and goes over here and he's winning, you know, medal after medal. Well, you know, you just, uh, you're looking at an upside down world, my friend. Absolutely. You know, a lot uh, of things, were, a lot of things change. You know, I was at, I was in Dallas. The night before I was at the Murchison house, the party that they had, and it was called Egyptian Nights. There were four presidents, four future presidents there. Uh, and I, I Meyer Lansky arranged. I went there under the predication I was going to play 
for the Dallas Cowboys that Clint Murchison Jr. owned the team. And it was a learning experience for me to watch him listen. And uh, it was an education, trust me. Wow. The people that I saw there and talked to, and, uh, and I was there that morning. I was out doing road work, and I ran right by Johnny Rizzelli, and he said, I thought you were leaving town. I said, well, I'm, I'm going to be gone pretty soon. He said, get out of town. You don't belong here. You know, they knew what was going down and it wasn't, it wasn't, you can't put the blame on the mafia. You can't put the blame on the Teamsters. You can't put the field for the whole Zabruder thing was one thing. And the whole Warren commission was total bullshit. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about some Yaleys that got together and put together a, a commission and they, they took Jack Ruby and they quit the question, Jack Ruby. And Jack Ruby said to them, you can't talk to me here. You got to move me somewhere else. We can't talk here. And they just ignored him. And he said, I guess you want me to tell you about Chicago, where he came from. And they said, no, we don't want to know about that. And, they just, and then you got Lee Harvey Oswald, who was supposed to have killed the president of the United States. And they took him in to question him. There was not one note taken. They didn't record one word of what was said. And when you see him coming out into the garage, he's being let out by a captain of the police and the guy steps away from him. Yeah. While Ruby walks up and shoots him. Yeah. I've so, seen that. Um, he stepped right away, stepped right out of the way and let that guy come oh, up. Oh, yeah. Knew that shit was they coming. knew what was going on. Yeah, he you knew know, that shit was coming. They're just, they're just closing the doors on things. You understand? Yeah. And everybody fell for the one bullet theory. I mean, the whole thing was it was a joke. Yeah. Uh, was, I mean, you got to understand where Oswald came from. Uh, it was it just the whole thing was a joke. Yeah. And it's it's going to come out. We're going to tell the truth about all. Of it. And, and it's time that the truth has been told, you know. No, I agree. Jack, listen, man, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you coming on the show. You've been an awesome guest. I love talking about this kind of content. Um, you know, are you on any type of social media or anything like that? So our, our uh, followers can, can keep up with you. Are you on anything? Facebook, Instagram, I'm or anything Facebook. like that? Facebook, Yeah, I'm on Facebook, but I'm there, but I'm, I'm there because we got projects that we're getting to right. ready to do. We got, we're building a great studio in Nevada. We've got four. We've got Family Legacy. We've got a couple other pictures we're going to do. All right. so, and I've got two more books coming out. So, Well, I can't so, wait. In the show notes of this episode, folks, you can look down there. I'll put a link to Family Legacy if you want to go pick up your copy and give it a read. Trust and sure if you enjoyed this interview, I'm sure you enjoy that book. Jack, listen, man, from the bottom of my heart, I really appreciate you coming on and giving me the time today. You've been a fantastic guest. And maybe when everything gets out and gets rolling, we can have you back on to the, discuss some of your projects. Absolutely. It'd be my pleasure. Well, thank you, my friend. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Hollywood Wade. That was Jack O'Halloran. And unfortunately, we are out of time. Tune in next week for an all new episode of Crime and Entertainment. Jack, we appreciate it, my friend. Take care. Thank you.